Good morning again. So, yes, uh, children can be dismissed. I was doing so good too. So what, what would you consider as the greatest thing, greatest possession that you could give somebody? And this is, this is not uh, counting God or um, the gospel. I mean, it's just like when you ask somebody, what's your favorite book? And they say the Bible. It's like, okay, well, I, I know your favorite book's the Bible. So I'm not going to know anything else about you unless you tell me what your other favorite book is. So uh, apart from God, apart from the gospel, what's the greatest thing, the greatest possession you could possibly give somebody? Your money, your car, your house. It'd be your life, right? It'd be your life. If you could give, uh, if you would give somebody your life, that would be the greatest thing that you could give them. Um, is there anyone in your life that you would actually give your life to protect? Now, I, I know that many of us, uh, if you're like me, have done scenarios if someone breaks into my house and, and they're going to be harming and attacking my family, um, they're going to meet violent Brandon Brown. Um, I'm going to get really violent on them. Uh, and the thing is, though, it, it can be really easy to say these things. You know, I'll give up my life for my wife or my family. Uh, it can be easy to say that when it's so far away, but whenever you're facing death, uh, it can be uh, something that maybe you haven't experienced or you haven't come up with, uh, come face to face with. I've talked to many people who said they're not scared of death at all, but then... They've got a disease, and then when death's facing them, it's not as easy as they think it's going to be. As a husband, uh, we are called to give up our lives, lay down your lives. Uh, that's not only, we, not, we usually don't have to do that um, uh, in the most literal sense. We don't have to usually give up our lives uh, physically. But it does mean to lay down your life uh, spiritually, sacrificially, uh, put her needs above your own. Lead in that way, sacrificially leading, put your family's needs above your own. This is an extreme example, but there's only uh, one mill in the house. Uh, your wife gets that mill, not you, right? It's, uh, that's just the idea. You, you sacrifice for your wife and at the same time lead, and women at the same time uh, let your husbands lead. Often, uh, we can reverse the order on that. And we're going to see this morning that there's two grooms. As a husband, we, we want to provide. And one groom that we're going to see this morning, he didn't even provide enough wine for them at their wedding celebration. That or they invited a bunch of booze hounds. So let's do a little summary, a little catch-up of where we've been so far in John. Uh, in John, uh, Jesus is the creator who made all things. Through him, all things were created. He is God. Um, and then we've seen uh, the witness of John the Baptist, right? And, and then after that, we've seen the calling of the first disciples. Now we're coming to the point in the book in chapter 2 where there are signs. Now, what are signs? First, I have to say is throughout John, you're going to see this theme of truth everywhere, truth everywhere. And, and the reason is that truth in that day uh, was becoming so confused, so blurry that nobody knew what the truth was. Uh, the idea is pushing out propaganda so much that the truth is confusing. Uh, you're going to see this in Pilate, in Jesus before Pilate. And he says he's about the truth. And, and what does Pilate say? What is truth? Questioning the very thing that truth is. Is. And so what these signs are, these signs are undeniable truth, undeniable proof that Jesus is the Messiah. He says at the very end of the book, uh, the purpose of this, uh, this book is, I write these things so that in them, by believing, you may have eternal life. That's the idea. That's the goal. There are seven signs. Now, John, 
uh, more than anybody else, he, he has a fascination uh, with biblical numerology, with symbols, with, um, with mystery, these kinds of things. He can be cryptic. If you don't believe me, go read Revelation. Same author. Numbers to him almost always have a special meaning. When you see a number in John, it usually always has a special meaning. That's not just in Revelation, that's um, in the Gospel of John as well. And these seven signs, uh, what would that refer back to? Well, the idea of completeness, it goes originally all the way back to the first seven days of creation. So these seven signs are the seven uh, signs that Jesus is recreating the world. They're the seven signs of new creation. So for instance, he heals a disease. What is that? These are the disease, it's thorns and thistles that's destroying his creation, and Jesus is removing it. It's a sign he's removing it. Today we're going to look at the first sign. Look at John 2, 1-2. to On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. So, we're at a wedding. It's at Cana. Um, we don't really know a whole lot about Cana. We do know that Nathaniel was from Cana. Um, Nathaniel was just mentioned right before this, which makes me like, I've been thinking probably way too much about that connection. Didn't find anything. Um, but uh, he's mentioned right before this. Uh, But it's in Cana, and the second miracle is also going to be in Cana. I'm confident something's going on here. I just can't uh, figure it out quite yet. But Mary is here, uh, Jesus is here, and his disciples are here. We don't know exactly who the wedding's for, maybe because it's Jesus and Mary, uh, perhaps a family member. Uh, We're just not sure. But then this problem occurs. Verse 3, just the beginning of verse 3. The, when the wine ran out, when the wine ran out. So, wedding runs out of wine. This is a huge thing, right? All of us, when we go to events, we expect different things. If you go to a funeral, you're expecting people to wear black, right? Uh, if you go to a celebration, what goes with that? Usually something like champagne or, or wine. These are perfect things to go with a celebration. If you go to a movie, you expect uh, maybe you'll see people with popcorn, right? At, at weddings, there is an expectation that there's going to be wine. Uh, Psalm says that wine gladdens the heart. It, it, this is a time of celebration, and the wine just makes it even better, right? It, it's a sign of the celebration. And this isn't grape juice. This is not grape juice. Um, I've had Welch's, and Welch's does not gladden my heart. <laughs> Promise you that. Uh, I, that interpretation comes from teetotalers at the prohibition, and uh, it's definitely not scripture. <laughs> it's definitely not scripture. Uh, there's so many uh, indications in scripture that allow you to drink wine, but it just says, you know, don't become drunk or be a drunkard. Um, how can you become drunk on grape juice? Uh, the, the potential there to be drunk means that it contains alcohol, right? <laughs> but there are people that will, will say, um, It's grape juice. So, I want to say right off the bat, this is the the groom's fault. This is the groom's fault. It's kind of like the opposite of today's weddings where um, where who who provides usually uh, at the wedding? Who who makes, uh, pays for the wedding, I guess. It's the uh, the bride's uh, side of the family, the bride's parents, right? The father of the bride, he pays for everything, which kind of upsets me with two girls. <laughs> but, but he's supposed, in, in this culture, it's the groom. This goes along with the idea of provision, right? The guy provides. And, and so he, he supplies the wedding. But they run out of wine. And we have no idea what it's like being in a, uh, a no-shame culture where uh, you cannot be shamed for anything that you do, right? You can do whatever you want, no shame, no guilt, uh, but this is a, a shame culture. <laughs> and if you don't have wine, you run out of wine, there is going to be shame on you. 
And it's going to come up uh, with questions. There's going to be questions about the groom's ability to provide if he can't even do something as simple as provide wine at uh, the biggest, possibly the biggest day of their lives, uh, their, their wedding celebration. There's already things swirling around in people's heads about his ability to provide. So Mary, they're out of wine. She gets this great idea. Well, we got a Jesus. We got Jesus. Why don't I just go to him? John 2, 3. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. So she goes to him and she's expecting him to do something. The wine runs out and she goes to Jesus and say they have no wine. This is obviously asking Jesus to do something. It's an expectation that he's going to. Is it a miracle? Probably not. She's probably not expecting a miracle. Uh, At this point in the narrative, uh, in other Gospels as well, it seems at this point Joseph is dead. And the person that she's been relying on for things is her son. It's been Jesus. And so um, Jesus has been an amazingly reliable son, and she thinks that Jesus will uh, be able to fix this problem. And so she just goes to Jesus. She's just used to relying on him. Now, has there ever been a time in your life where you have failed to provide for your family? How'd that feel? Maybe some of you are like, I've never, never failed. But God has built within us certain roles. And there is a desire for a guy to be able to provide for his family. It's one of the main things a a man wants to do. That's why you're just wired to want to go to work and provide. Uh, Women, they feel the need to have and take care of children. It's just different wiring. Men want to provide, though. It's natural. So just to summarize where we've been, we're at this wedding, and the wedding runs out of wine, and Mary thinks that Jesus can take care of this problem. So she goes to Jesus. How does Jesus respond? Beginning of verse 4. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? What does he mean by that? What does this have to do with me? Not my problem? Yeah. Basically, this isn't my problem. The groom is supposed to provide. I'm not the groom at this wedding. It's not my responsibility to provide for this wedding. It's not my job. It's not my, uh, I don't have to do this. But look at the second thing he says in John uh, 2.4 in this answer. Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. I almost want to just, like, what? (laughs) What? Can you provide one? My hour hasn't come. What are you talking about? In John's gospel, uh, Jesus often responds to mundane concerns or mundane questions uh, with fourth dimensional answers, right? Uh, When we're talking to Jesus, we're playing checkers and he's playing chess. He's just thinking on a different level than us. Uh, a Samaritan woman, she comes to Jesus, oh yeah, or he comes to her anyway, but she goes to the well, she's like, oh yeah, we always come to this well, this is an amazing, special well, this well is from, from Jacob, and we come here all the time to get our water, and Jesus says, I have some living water for you, and you'll never be thirsty again. Just different dimension, and then she automatically goes from this being a special well to, can you give me this water so I don't have to come here anymore? It's just uh, he's thinking on a different level. You must be born again, Nicodemus. How do I go back in my mother's womb to be born again? 
That's what Jesus is doing here. Do you have wine? My hour has not yet come. This is a different answer. He's doing the same thing. And that's an enormous sort of forehead smack uh, clue that this isn't just about Jesus turning water into wine. What does the hour mean? What does the hour mean? Something very specific. Uh, Throughout the Gospels, it's mentioned several times. And over and over again, he'll say, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. But then, when you get uh, right before his death, and right before he's about to be arrested and then crucified, he says, my hour has come. The hour has arrived. And then he's praying to the Father, Father, what shall I say? Will you save me from this hour? This hour is the time when Jesus will be arrested and crucified and killed. The hour most specifically refers to his death. So, now that we've solved that, what the hour means, let's plug it back into our text and see if that makes sense. Mary comes to Jesus. They have no wine. Jesus, can you provide wine? It's not my day to die. Again, you almost want to, like, what? What are you talking about? That, again, doesn't make sense. You guys see the problem? Hour certainly means death. But she's asking about wine. Can you provide wine? Not dying today. What's he mean? If I go ask you, can you provide wine? You're not going to say a thing about whether you're dying or not today. I'm proposing to you that just like John does, that wine here has a different meaning, has a symbolic meaning. It's a symbol for his blood. Now, I have four reasons for seeing wine as blood. I actually have five, but I'm not going to do the fifth one until later. But here's the first reason that I think the wine means blood. It makes perfect sense in Jesus' response. When uh, she says, can you provide wine? My hour has not yet come. If providing wine... Uh, means providing his blood, then of course you're going to die. Why? Life is in the blood. If she's asking, can you provide your blood, and he says, I'm not dying today, then it makes sense that Jesus is interpreting symbolically, spiritually, like he does in other places, that wine means blood. The second um, like I said, another example is that words often mean something else in John. Lazarus dies. What does Jesus say? Our friend Lazarus is sleeping. Let's go wake him up. He does this all the time. Flesh. Jesus, can I have some bread? Eat my flesh. It's just pervasive in John. Third, wine is already a symbol for Jesus' blood. Where else? Communion, right? Wine already refers to his blood at communion. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And the fourth reason is that it makes sense within the bigger narrative. Jesus is going to conclude in chapter 6, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not be saved. Now, eat my flesh, drink my blood, those are obviously communion symbols. Flesh is bread. Uh, His blood is wine. Eat, drink. Right? That's his conclusion. Now, if that's the case, if that's the conclusion in chapter 6, eat his flesh, drink his blood, then... He has already done two communion miracles before that conclusion in chapter 6. 
they have already, when he feeds the 5,000 people with loaves of bread, they have already ate his flesh. And now here at this wedding, they are drinking his blood. And that's why in chapter 6, he's going to conclude, eat my flesh and drink my blood, and you shall not be saved. Does that make sense? Tracking that? Some? I think uh, confusing for some. When you just insert wine, it makes no sense what he's saying. But when you know that the hour is referring to his death, everything just starts making more sense. This is a living parable. What do I mean by that? This is actually an historical event. It actually happened. But what Jesus is doing is he's using the wedding at Cana as a parable to teach us about what his death is like. What his death does for us. So, that only brings up another question. How in the world does a wedding teach about death? Jesus has already brought us there when he says the hour. It's about his death. Well, Jesus has a wedding day. Jesus has a bride. He's a groom. We become unified and reconciled at the cross. This idea of Jesus being the bridegroom is a huge theme, and uh, it's in John, uh, John the Baptist, one of his main ways he talks about Jesus. In John 5, in a couple chapters, a few chapters, he's going to say, John the Baptist is going to say, uh, the friend of the bridegroom rejoices to see the bridegroom. Jesus is already being labeled a groom in another chapter. This is already in his head. What this is teaching us is that Jesus is a greater groom. This groom has failed to provide wine on their wedding day. Jesus is going to provide his own blood for his bride. We've talked about our favorite or greatest possession and what you would do for your family or bride. But none of us have ever proven that we'd actually give up our life for our bride. What greater currency is there for, than for someone to give up their own life, their own blood? What greater currency is there? A wealthy person, they can, they can spend millions on their bride, just spend absolute millions. They can drain their entire fortune on their bride. They're still going to be alive afterwards. They're still going to be living. Life is the most precious possession you can give away. And because of that, and because blood is limited, that means blood is a currency that is astronomical. Astronomical. So I'm going to paraphrase how this conversation goes with Jesus and Mary. Wedding runs out of wine. Mary goes to Jesus. They're out of wine. Could you be able to get us some more wine, Jesus? Jesus says, what does this have to do with me? I'm not the groom. I'm not the responsibility. It's not my wedding day. My hour has not yet arrived. I'm not dying today. Translation, there is an hour coming when I will give my bride everything that I have. But that's not today. There is an hour coming when I am going to give my life away for my bride. But that's not today. Mary's like, I just wanted you to go to the store, Jesus. What are you talking about? <laughs> Why does he do it this way? Because illustrations, they help us understand. I'm often trying to think of images to help you understand uh, complex uh, uh, theological topics and things. Uh, and this, what, that's what this is. This is an illustration. 
This is Jesus uh, in performing this miracle. We're going to see how he's teaching us about his giving to his bride, about the way this groom gives to his bride. And he's going to show you that he gives his blood abundantly and richly. So what does the blood do to us? What does the blood do? We are his bride. We're the church. If we're his bride, what does Jesus' blood do for us? Look at John 2, 6. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. So there's six stone uh, water jars. These water jars are set up by the Pharisees. You guys remember the Pharisees? We've already seen them when they've gone to John the Baptist. I've already shown you that these are the purifiers of Israel. They are under the rule of Rome. They've read that from Deuteronomy 28. If you guys break my law, you're going to have another nation rule over you. Uh, They see another nation ruling over them, the Romans, so they know they've broke the law. So what do they try to do? Purify Israel by the law. But they've done extra things. They've taken extra steps. And now they have these Uh, They know water purifies from uh, Leviticus. They see all these priests. You do this water, you do this thing. It'll purify the people. So they've actually, they've set up purification jars. You you wash your hands like this. You can be be pure. The idea is that these external actions would make you spiritually pure before God. And if you're spiritually pure before God, bring the Messiah and he'll destroy the Romans. Then we can rule the world. Pharisees are going to later teach that you don't eat with defiled hands. You've got to wash your hands in these jars. Purify them. External things, like I said, make you pure before God. That's how some people view baptism, by the way. Some people view baptism. You you go get baptized, you receive the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit washes you, and you become pure before God. Um, No. There has been a, uh, a hard denial that water actually does any purifying work. And we've already seen that uh, when John the Baptist, he's making this clear. And this is um, in John, like all these themes just keep continuing. In John, in John the, ba- uh, John the Baptist, he says that um, uh, I baptize you with water, but he is coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. There's already this idea that What I'm doing doesn't actually make you pure. What Jesus is coming to do will actually cleanse you. And you're going to see that in Peter later on. Um, Baptism now saves you. Everybody's like, whoa, what what are you talking about, Peter? Um, Baptism saves us? He says, not because it washes dirt away from the body. Water actually doesn't do anything. And he, he, I love that he goes on to say, not because it washes dirt away from the body. It, it's not this external, physical thing happening to you that makes you pure before God. That's how the Pharisees thought. So imagine that there is a, uh, a diseased land, right? There's a, a diseased land, and you just look out, and there's lots of uh, trees that are dead or dying, and, and then the, on the fruit, um, you look at the fruit and it's just rotting and it's disgusting, right? Now, how are you? Uh, you let's say that you're you're there for a while and you do some investigation and you realize that the soil is bad. The soil is basically dead. There's no nutrients. It's just dry, and that's why nothing can live in it. Well, how are you going to fix it? The Pharisees would say. Go grab a toothbrush and scrub some of that rotting fruit. Grab a toothbrush and just scrub clean some of that rotting fruit. It's that idea that that external scrubbing of that actually (laughs) makes the soil pure, which it doesn't. You know, they're not actually even dealing with the real problem. They're dealing with the external things. They're dealing with the fruit, not the root When you tell someone, get a toothbrush and scrub the fruit, that's the same thing as saying, 
If you're spiritually impure, go wash your hands. There is a dead soil within you. That needs to be purified if other things are going to live. In the wedding at Cana, Jesus is telling us that only his blood purifies. How is that? John 2, 7. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them uh, up to the brim. So they have these jars, they fill them up with water, they fill them up to the brim, and now go down to verse 9. The water had now become wine. So the water was transformed into wine. He transformed the water into wine. Now, how does that tell us that religion doesn't purify us, but the blood of Jesus does? Well, one, he changes the water, right? He transforms the water. The water's gone. We, we don't need this anymore. And then what does he do? He replaces it with wine that, uh, resim- uh, that san- some symbolically stands for his blood. And what are they sitting in? Purification jars. Purification jars. The external religious water of the Pharisees, they don't cleanse anyone or purify anyone. Why else would he put wine in purification jars if it's not for his, meaning his blood? Only his blood is what should be in these purification jars. Because only his blood is what purifies us. Jesus purifies the soil. He gets to the root of the issue. He gets to the heart of the issue. Purify can mean two things. You stand before God. You can have this idea there's a, a, a white robe that you have to wear before God. And if there's stains on it, judgment, stains represent sin. Gotta have a clean white robe. In that sense, Jesus does purify. He cleanses it. He's like strong bleach just on that, just taking away all the stains, right? There's an idea that Jesus makes us white as snow before God. This is uh, judicially standing before God as being perfect. At the same time, not being perfect. That's sanctification, where if you're perfect before God, Judicially speaking, he is at the same time working on you on the inside to actually make you perfect, right? It's called sanctification. It's that process of making us holy. He's removing sin from our lives. Uh, He is actually purifying us day by day. So there is a, a sense that you're already perfect before God, but there's another sense that you're actually becoming perfect and not just, uh, I'm going to keep living in sin, but I'm also perfect before God. No. If God has made you pure before him, he will actually begin making you pure. I wonder if the glories of Christ are ever really, truly going to be known to the fullest extent. We're spoken of as being dead. Now, Most men will do whatever they can for their bride because their bride is beautiful in their eyes. They're going to do whatever they want for her, whatever they can for her. But in eternity, the father points down to the earth and he says to the son, this is your bride. Son looks down, sees like a giant casket and the casket opens up. It's his bride inside. It's just a rotting, dead corpse, worms going through the face. Is this too much? Is this too much? Too gruesome? We're going to keep going anyway. Worms, there's also maggots. Those are coming out too. It's just a, a gruesome, disgusting, just disgusting picture. But it's reality. It's reality. You're marrying your bride. To you, she is beautiful. We were not beautiful. We were dead. We were as gross and disgusting as can be. 
He doesn't gag, though. He doesn't regurgitate. He actually grieves over what's become of his creation. And he says, Father, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to defeat that which has made her like this. I am going to remove the sin that has done this to her, though she's done it willingly. I'm going to defeat the death that has done this to her. I'm going to make blood flow through her veins again. Lazarus, come forth. I'm going to make her walk out of that casket. Again, these are always themes in John. In Revelation, John, uh, Jesus says, I make all things new. Blood purifies also Revelation. They washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. This morning, I can only point you to Jesus Christ. There is nothing else I can do. You must be pure before God. There is no other way. And the only way that you become pure is through Jesus Christ alone. There is not any other way. There is not any other means. You know, we see, you see a movie or read a book, and then, you know, there's a huge problem they can't solve. There's always this line where they go, there must be some other way. There is no other way. It is only through the blood of Jesus Christ that you can be made clean. And if there is, like I I talked about a couple weeks ago, how we have these arguments within our head uh, about what we might say to God on on Judgment Day, which is basically justifying the way we're living now, uh, and and these are what I'm going to present to God on on Judgment Day, because I'm not going to come to Christ. Uh, So I'm going to present these arguments. The only argument you will ever need before God, and this will make you smarter uh, and look more intelligent and wiser than any lawyer that Harvard or Yale has ever produced, the only thing you need to plead is the blood of the Lamb. That's it. God is not going to punish someone if he's already punished his son for their sins. That's judicially pure. Actually becoming pure. Sanctification, though. God is the only one who is strong enough to overcome the power of sin. Right? He's the only one that's strong enough to do that. There is a grip that sin has on you, and the only one with an arm strong enough to pry that hand off of you is God. And just as God in the Exodus, when he sees the blood of the Passover lamb on the doorpost, his wrath passes over, and then he frees them from the Egyptians, from their slavery to the Egyptians. In the same way, when he sees you covered by the blood of the lamb, he removes the grip of sin, and he frees you from slavery to sin. What are two ways Jesus is better, a better groom than the groomsman? First way, verse 7, he says to his servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. Fill them to the brim. Make these jars as full as they possibly can be. Now, there is a, a, a contrast here uh, between the groom and Jesus. The groom ran out of wine. Jesus is saying, yeah, fill the jars up. And they fill them to the brim. You know, they're, they're filling them. Uh, he, he just has to provide wine for this wedding. Uh, wine is not, I mean, it, it could be expensive, but it's not too great uh, 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 of a price. Jesus' blood is the greatest and most expensive and most, uh, most precious currency. And what does he say? Fill it to the brim. Make it abundant. He gives it all. He gives it all. His blood is enough 
to cover every single sin we've ever committed. His blood is enough to cover every sin we've ever committed. His blood is enough to fully save people from all of their sins. He doesn't cover 80% of your sins. He doesn't cover 90% of your sins. He covers all of them. His sacrifice is sufficient. Wine is also going to do double duty, just as it does in communion. What are we doing at communion? You, you drink wine because what? It's, one, it's a celebration of what Christ has accomplished on the cross. But two, uh, we're also drinking his blood, right? And having, um, uh, remembering that, uh, his sacrifice on the cross for us is double duty there. Um, it's doing double duty here. It's wine for a celebration. And for his bride, there is going to be a marriage feast, a, a messianic banquet. And um, there's going to be a celebration, and wine will be abundant. We see this uh, over and over again that in the Old Testament, that the messianic age is characterized by an abundance of wine. We've actually read one of the texts this morning in Isaiah. But the second way Jesus is a better groom, John 2, 9 to 10, when the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. What does he mean? I think people often read this and they think that he's commending him. Oh, you actually, you've waited. Now you've served the good wine now. Uh, at least we got something now and it's the good wine. He's commending him for that. No, uh, they actually, the idea is you, you serve the, um, the good wine first. Uh, that way, when people actually um, <laughs> have their function and they can uh, understand what they're drinking, it's the good wine. But whenever they're... Uh, Later on in the party, uh, you, it, the poor wine comes out, and you can just drink that afterwards. It makes sense. But the point of this is, isn't whether he's commending him or not. The point is a comparison between Jesus and the groom. Who served the, the poor wine first, which came first? The groom. Who served the greater wine that came later? Jesus. He's saying that Jesus is not only abundance in what he supplies, but he also supplies that of a greater quality. That which he supplies is of a greater quality. Um, if you guys uh, ever go to bars, I don't think uh, you, uh, I don't know if you are or whatever, but I've been to many bars in my life because uh, even before then I used to get drunk all the time and go to bars all the time. Uh, and so you're going to occasionally hear a bar illustration. Uh, but in a bar, a uh, typical bar, uh, the higher up you go, uh, the, the better quality of the drink it is, right? And you go all the way top shelf, that can be a very expensive drink. Well, if we were talking about the quality of wine Jesus has, it would go beyond the bar shelf. He's reaching from his private stock in heaven, right? Uh, th this is going to be amazing wine that he is grabbing. Again, this is not Welch's. This is not grape juice. Wine gladdens the heart. And he is grabbing from his private stock, probably something reserved for the messianic banquet. Uh, can you imagine what that would taste like? Can you imagine what that would taste like? Can you also imagine uh, just the food that will be cooked at the, at the marriage feast between the bride and the lamb? The amazing food. It's going to be probably no, no chicken there, though. I don't like chicken. Lastly, and we're, we're wrapping up a couple, just two more quick things. With this whole thing, I have to discuss with you, and as soon as I say this, these two words, you're, you're just going to just start going to sleep. And honestly, uh, it's called inaugurated eschatology. Uh, and I have to explain this. It's what's, uh, what theologians and scholars they talk about. It's called the already not yet. So, for instance, when you hear me say, after I've shown you in the first sermon that um, I connected John 1 with John uh, 20 and 21, 
uh, where the first day of the week at his resurrection, this is uh, the launching of new creation, the launching of the new world. You hear that and you see that in the text. I've shown that, how he's mim- uh, m- uh, mimicking back to Genesis 1. But you might be like, like, okay, new creation, I'm looking around, this world still seems pretty fallen, right? Uh, what does that mean? Well, it's an already not yet, right? Um, it, if you look at it at this time, there's only a few pe- people in Israel that are actually even followers of Jesus or even believers, right? The nations are all deceived. Everyone's deceived. You compare that now where there's at least 2 billion people that at least proclaim to be Christians, right? It's a completely different than at this time. But the idea is that at the resurrection, uh, the promises of God begin to have an initial fulfillment, and we are being fulfilled in us right now, but they will be more fully realized when he returns. So for instance, um, you are a new creation right now that has begun. Paul's very clear. If anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. It's already begun. Jesus already gave us the Holy Spirit. You're not perfect. I, I've met you all, except for Seth. Dude, he's close. <laughs> Dude, guys, he's a, he's a great guy. Um, but you're not perfect. But you will be when Christ returns. You get the Holy Spirit now. The Holy Spirit hasn't fully purified you internally. He hasn't fully removed all the thorns and thistles from you. But he's doing that work day by day. Outwardly, or we are wasting away. Inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. And yes, you will get a new perfect body. This body has to die. So when I talk about a new creation, so you have to think of it in terms of the garden. In the garden, everything's perfect. Everything's lush. Everything's beautiful. Everything's vibrant. And then at the fall, there's thorns and thistles. That begins, and then the whole world is spiritually overtaken with thorns and thistles. Now you must think of the world as a wilderness. And when Jesus, at his resurrection, what he does, when he starts having Christians, you start seeing in little places when people um, become a Christian, what you see is like roses that are popping up in the wilderness. Just patches of beautiful bushes, grass, just popping up in random places. It's just overtaking the world. It's kind of like uh, the idea in uh, C.S. Lewis books, uh, Chronicles of Narnia, where Aslan walks, and when he walks, the, the grass is just being renewed. You know, everything's just being renewed. The snow's going away. It's the idea with Jesus. He's just, uh, new creation is in him. He just touches things. The disease goes away. They become new, right? He just throws those thorns and thistles away. And this is the last thing. Remember I said signs go together. These signs go together. There's seven signs. Seven signs of the new creation. The first and seventh sign, they go together. The first sign is a parable about what Jesus will do at his death. The seventh sign is Jesus actually dying for his bride. So, does that have anything to do with Adam and Eve, or the original creation? Well, now, this isn't me. I didn't think of this. There's many, many people that have shown this. But how does that relate to Adam and Eve? How was Eve created from Adam? Out of his rib, right? A deep sleep fell upon Adam, and God took his rib, and he, and he made uh, the woman. He made Eve. Well, on the cross, and it says Jesus, he didn't go into a deep sleep, but it says he gave up his last breath. He dies. Then he's stabbed in the rib, and then out he pulls, the, 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 he pulls it out, the spear out, and then out of his rib flows his blood and his water, right? This purifying blood and water, just as Eve was created out of uh, Adam's rib, the church is created out of the rib of Jesus, out of this purifying blood and water. And the third day is when he rose from the dead, launches new creation. What day did this wedding happen? the third day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We pray, Father, not that perhaps the Spirit give you further application, but I want it 
to transform, and that only comes through the Holy Spirit transforming us. I pray for transformation for all of us. I pray that we would all become more like Christ. And we love you, and we thank you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our closing song together. We're going to sing our new song, Here is Love, verse 2, which talks about Jesus' death for us and how it is enough to cleanse us.